Okay. Um, a great pleasure to welcome Peter Haidu all the way from Shenzhen in university in South China, where he currently teaches. He's taught at other institutions in China and his native Hungary. He's affiliated with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And he's a comparatist of, as his, even his geographical um, presence might suggest, of very wide reach and very varied topics. Uh, some of you may have heard him speak at the Prismatic Translation Conference uh, in Oxford a couple of years ago, and you'll find his contribution in the Matthew Reynolds edited volume that came out this year, Prismatic Translation. And there Peter Haidu has written about the very complicated in any language, and doubtless at least as complicated in Hungarian, question of how you translate or how people have translated Petronius. So he comes to us today with a lot of thoughts on that front and he's attentive in his many published works to important topics in Latin literature and its uh, reception, Horace, canon formation when it comes to the Greco-Roman classics in Hungary and so on. And he's going to be turning today to the silver Latin area, which we touched on last week in relation to the sly passage from Stendhal where Julien Sorel is presented with an eight volume deluxe edition of Tacitus by the Bishop. It's perhaps worth adding just in a little footnote that of course we've tried to be as conveners very hospitable to a wide range of European countries and languages. We started in Russia, for example, uh, but we shouldn't think of Hungary as marginal in this respect. 150 years ago, 700 bishops were gathering in Rome for the first Vatican Council, the proceedings of which were to be entirely in Latin. Many of the bishops were tongue-tied, some were probably ignorant. All of them looked with uh, a mixture of admiration and horror at the Latinity of the Hungarian bishops who swept the floor with the quality of their linguistic proficiency. So over now to Peter to give his paper. As in previous weeks, we'll have a 15 or 20 minute paper from our main speaker. And then as interlocutor, uh, it is no surprise to find Stephen Harrison being the most appropriate possible uh, respondent to this paper. Both of our speakers have handouts which are going to show up in the in the chat. In fact, in Peter's case, it's a, a PowerPoint. Um, but without further ado, let's take it away. And then after the two talks, which will be recorded, we'll have the usual 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene for question and answer session. So a great pleasure to welcome all the way from China, but still in some sense at the heart of Europe, Peter Haidu, over to you. Um, okay, with a, with a microphone this time. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be able to speak to you about this topic. And uh, now I try to uh, share something with you. Uh, Okay, uh, I would like to share the screen, but the host disabled participant screen sharing. So please allow me to share. Yeah, sorry, you should be able to. Um, ah, here we go. Okay. Right, you should be able to now. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Uh, okay. Uh, you hear me, right? Because yes, perfect. Okay, sorry, because of the message appeared on my screen that unmute yourself, but it was rather uh, advice than uh, an order. So I would like to start with this story of the Hungarian Jacobins. Uh, I'm, 
they didn't call them Jacobins. It's a nickname or, or something which other people thought of them. So it was a kind of conspiracy at the end of the 18th century when uh, seven people were executed and uh, 200 people were arrested. And these were gentlemen, mostly, I mean, many of them were uh, Freemasons. And in this period, when these 200 people, well, almost 200 people were in prison, uh, Janos Nemet, the public persecutor, told of them, what is this miracle of God that I can hardly find any prisoner among these Hungarians without a copy of Tacitus? So these people who wanted something like a new enlightened regime in Hungary or the Habsburg Empire, they all were reading Tacitus, very probably mostly the Agricola, uh, to understand the mechanisms of tyranny. And Kozinci, this uh, all, who was spent seven years in prison uh, of, after this trial, he started organizing a national literature and uh, also promoting uh, translations. And during this organizing period, he, uh, he had a huge amount of correspondence, many, many friends all around Hungary. And we know what his friends were working on in this period in the first two or three decades of the 19th century. And almost a dozen friends reported to Kozinci that they are working on Tacitus translations. So they were really enthusiastic about the translations project in general, but especially on translating Tacitus as coping with the miserable situation in Hungary and, and how somehow understand how oppression works. Uh, the first, uh, okay, most of these translations remained unfinished and unpublished. We, uh, the first which was published was, but one of the first which was published was George Barit's translation, uh, the Agricola de Germania and the Dialogues de Oratoribus in 1822. Uh, he also completed, also uh, translated the complete Tacitus a couple of years later, but that remained unpublished. But fortunately, we have a manuscript from the Agricola. So we have two versions of Agricola by George Baritz, and we can see how much the translation strategies changed or his translation strategies changed between 22 and 36. Uh, both times the ideal was a literal translation which keeps the word order and also the rhetorical structure of the source text. But we can see that in the meantime, these language reform was going on and many new words were coined in Hungarian uh, and the telling example is that virtus was translated by Boris in 22 as virtus so uh, practically a latin word in 36 he could already knew the brand new coinage erin uh, a new a neolo neo neologism neologism from the language reform period. But uh, soon after, in 1844, Latin stopped being the official language in Hungary. And that had consequences for the school system, which previously focused on verbal and memorial aspects of language teaching, because those who were getting a good ec ec uh, uh, education, uh, were trained to be able to deliver public speeches in the administration or in the legal system. Now, Latin became really a dead language in Hungary as well. So uh, the translation became the main pedagogical tool in uh, the Hungarian schools. So uh, translation was practiced in the school and teachers became the typical translators of classical prose as well. And this school of, of the, uh, didactic routine of, of these teachers can be seen in, the, in their translations. The Agricola remained the, more, the most uh, popular work of Tacitus 
during this uh, during the second half of the 19th century as well, especially between uh, 1847, uh, 49 and 67. Uh, but one uh, here is one good example of this kind of pedagogical translation. Ivan Telfi, who was a professor of classical philology, uh, most interested in Greek law, but in 1861, he produced a, a translation of the Agricola and the Grammania for uh, high school students. Uh, we can see from the very cheap appearance of this translation that it was designed for school and, only and also from other uh, features of this translation, like one of the footnotes, or so a couple of footnotes. This is a very good uh, example, I suppose. In chapter or caput 22, the word retractatur is translated in the main text as they discuss. Then there is a footnote attached to this translation, which says, and not pull back. Uh, this is just a translation, it's monolingual. So the Latin text is not printed there, but you can see that he found it uh, very important to explain that this word in this uh, given place doesn't mean what it usually does, pull back, but they discuss. So uh, he imagines a schoolboy reading the translation with the Latin original in hand as well. Uh, this, uh, it, this uh, what you see here is not that translation, but a similar one from the 20th century, or oh, the uh, visual appearance of the of Taylor's translation was like that, which we call uh, the Axel, Otsel Cribs. Otsel was the name of the publishing house, an Atria publishing house, it's a second hand bookstore, which published this kind of a pedagogical tools for children, uh, which usually uh, contained glossaries, translations, explanations of the text, also translation as a tool to understand the source text. Uh, and uh, they, this series published mostly Latin authors for school uh, purposes. And we can see that this translation this kind of translation relies on the presence of the source text uh, and doesn't want to replace the source text for the uh, target text readers. Uh, the purpose of such uh, translation is to make the source text structure visible. Uh, and these are for, uh, for school, but most of the translators of Latin prose were school teachers uh, high school teachers, so uh, the strategies are somehow similar most of the time. Oh, sorry. Uh, what did I do? Uh, come on. Um, a typical example of this is uh, Kalman Chiki's complete translation of Tacitus, in which he tried to uh, give uh, to uh, to make readers understand the sublime pathos and the melancholy of Tacitus, but with these uh, strategies of uh, making this, making the Hungarian text with the same word order and the same length as the uh, source text had. Uh, actually, uh, he used uh, very little archaisms in the translation in these complete translation of Tacitus, he also wrote an uh, introduction in which the style of the Hungarian text is more, much more archaic than that of the translation. Uh, but these, uh, thing, these ideas, pathos, resignation, political disappointment were common places of the Hungarian reception of Tacitus in the 19th century. There, are, there were some other translators in the 20th century who tried to get rid of this school-bound uh, translation tradition of Tacitus. Arpad Sabo, who was a, a young uh, uh, classical philologist at that time, he translated the Agricola and the Germ Germania uh, in, a, in, the, in a series of the bilingual classics in which he tried to do other kind of translation. Uh, much less 
uh, close to the original text and try to create a Hungarian text which doesn't really supposes that the Latin is also there, even if the, in this translation it was there, uh, you could read uh, this, this his Hungarian text as an individual, independent, uh, self-sufficient Hungarian text. And maybe even more interesting is Jua Peter's translation, which is the only simplifying translation in Hungarian from Tacitus. Uh, this is the cover of this book. The title is Tiberius and His Age. Actually, it's uh, the first two books of the Annales. And um, with this simplifying attitude, he tried to write something like a biographical novel in Hungarian. Even if in his introduction, he wrote that Tacitus is actually a poet, he didn't want to create a poetic text in Hungarian, rather wanted to give back the simple content of the Tacitian text without uh, doing something about the style or uh, the common places like the density and compound nature of the Tacitian text. Uh, the final example and the final translation of this story is uh, Istvan Borzak's translation of the complete Tacitus from 1970 because his prestige was so high in the Hungarian academia that in the last uh, 50 years, nobody tried to retranslate Tacitus. So it's a remarkable achievement. And this became the Tacitus in Hungarian for half a century. Uh, what was his ideal? In the afterword, he said, if a translator wanted to represent the tacity and density also in the number and order of words, their ambition would result in incomprehensibility and ridicule. But from this, you can see that the implication is still that the idea is to represent the tacity and density in the number and order of words. Just it's, mm, alas, impossible. Uh, he also wrote in this afterword, it would have been easier to adapt the whole text to the Hungarian language of today, but the, then the reader wouldn't have been given Tacitus, but a replica that lacks its flavor and real essence. So um, not the language of today, but what language? Language of the past? No, not the language of uh, the future either. It's a language uh, Borjak actually created for this special purpose to translate Tacitus. You can see from this a little uh, chart that amplification, explanation, etymology were, uh, were strategies he used everywhere, every, on every page of his translation. Uh, you can see that usually the, uh, the, the uh, translation is much longer than the Latin text, but not only longer because the Hungarian needs more words, but because he adds something. The best, or my, my favorite example is the Invisi, uh, looked at with hostile eyes, because he wants to explain that this word, Invisus, comes from video, that vision is implied in this uh, word. So he explains, expands a lot, uh, Sometimes uh, maybe there is a pedagogical instinct behind this. He really wants to explain uh, the uh, Tacitan density or compound nature of the of the text instead of representing it. His Hungarian text is not dense or compound. It's rather explaining a lot, and uh, but through these explications explanations readers can understand how condensed the Tacitian style is. He uses a lot of poetic features as one, archaisms, neologisms. Uh, his stylistic ideas seem to be a fragmented text frag with fragmented structures, very short phrases. And also he uses very few verbs and uh, the, this text is very, very slow, very slow reading, very difficult as well but not the way as Tacitus is uh, difficult. 
He also leaves a lot of Latin words in the text, in the Hungarian text. And this is an, just another example of his explanation and et etymologization. Uh, these uh, ablativus absolutus mancus integra domo is translated as also that his household was that time still untouched. Untouched, why? Instead of whole or not, not diminished, just untouched. Because he wants to explain that the word integer comes from tango. Uh, I, I suppose that the Hungarian translation lacks any kind of real meaning in this context. But I would like to uh, mention one more thing. I started how, how important Tacitus at the beginning of this translation history was for, for uh, the resistance, for the understanding of tyranny. Now, Borjak many times seems to like the tyrant more than the rebels. This is the story of uh, Tiberius and Asinius Gallus, when Tiberius plays being shy and uh, says that he cannot run the whole state, maybe a little part, and Asinius Gallus says that, tell me which part exactly, and Tiberius is upset. Uh, Bozak also wrote a school commentary that time, and in this commentary he wrote, a senior girl's question was certainly tactless and superfluous. Even on Tiberius' impassive face, one could see the indignation. So this here, a senior Gallus is the wrong guy, not Tiberius. And in the translation, you can see this, uh, something similar, uh, like at any word, so he, uh, because he thought, uh, a senior Gallus thought, he discovered some resentment on his face, Tiberius' face. Uh, probably the implication is, I think, that uh, Tiberius is not really upset. It's only this very suspicious guy, Asinius Gallus, thinks that he can see something like offense uh, on his face. And also in the end, uh, when uh, Bozak has to translate this tamquam, uh, and which is, I mean, an idea. Somehow, somebody thinks that there is a reason. So uh, this sentence explains why Tiberius hated uh, Asinius Gallus. In Bozak's uh, translation, it, you can see he puts here a semicolon, stops the sentence. Uh, these uh, reasons why probably in this translation everybody hated Asinius Gallus has real reasons, not ideas that Tiberius has in his mind. So uh, for the last half a century, Tacitus is not so much against tyrants. In his Hungarian translation, uh, there is a sometimes um, more uh, understanding attitude towards tyrants like Tiberius. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for a fascinating paper which takes us into politics, takes us into translation, and also the realm of pedagogy, which so far we've only really skirted around in this seminar. Without further ado, let's pass over to your uh, respondent, Stephen Harrison. Share. Okay. Okay. I found so thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me and thank you, Peter, for a very interesting paper. Uh, I don't have any Hungarian, so unfortunately, sounds a beautiful sounding language. Um, so uh, I will try in my response to draw out some broader themes and perhaps come back to Borjak at the end. Uh, uh, but as a Horace scholar, I'm of course aware of Borjak's uh, Teubner text of Horace, and he was one of the few uh, scholars that my professor Ros Robin Nisbet wrote in the Festschrift of. He wrote in Borjak's Festschrift uh, and, and respected him. I never met him, but uh, Robin Nisbet rated him highly, which is pretty good. So uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting. I wanted to begin with a kind of accidental connection between uh, Tastus and Hungary, which may play a role. It's interesting that the annals, uh, of course, are, are prominent here. 
And it, it's perhaps just an interesting fact that one of the major episodes towards the beginning of the annals, which is one of the, the ways in which Tasta sets things up there, actually takes place in what is now Hungarian territory. That's to say the Roman province of Pannonia. And in my little handout in the chat, there's a little map which shows you that, as we all know, Romania is Dacia, but that Pannonia is basically the two upper and lower Pannonias are basically the territory of modern Hungary. And I think this, this may be one of the things pushing towards Tacitus, as well as the political aspects, which are I'll come to in a minute. And we can see this uh, in other parts of Europe where uh, the texts which mention those parts of Europe tend to be more popular. Of course, Tastus Agricola has been very popular in this country uh, since it's uh, the major ancient source on, on Britain apart from Caesar's commentaries. And of course, uh, uh, the Germania has been a major uh, thing in German intellectual culture. Uh, and I would compare it to the modern Romanian interest in Ovid, who of course ended up uh, in exile and died in uh, Romanian territory. And of course there's been recent work on that because of the bimillennium of Ovid's death. So I think that that, that is an interesting background. In terms of uh, Borjak and, and the time when he was writing, uh, I think, uh, some of the themes in, in the annals, and especially perhaps the Pannonian mutiny, the bit that takes place in modern Hungary, do raise some key questions for the Hungary of, of Borjak's uh, maturity, uh, the, the Soviet-dominated Hungary of uh, between 1949 and 1989, the Hungary that I grew up knowing about. Knowing about. So what happens uh, in the transition of power. Of course, the mutiny happens in Tacitus partly because of the death of Augustus, and Tacitus is very keen to stress what happens now. We've never had this before. Power has never moved in, in this way. Uh, and uh, that's not unlike perhaps what happened after the death of Stalin, those three years in which there was, was uh, a lot of maneuvering uh, before Khrushchev comes to power in 1956. Uh, the problem of keeping order in a militarized empire with uh, uh, territories quite a long way, of course, is uh, um, the problem of the Warsaw Pact. And uh, of course, how to uh, cope with a popular rising would be very uh, topical uh, after 1956 in Hungary, which I, even before my time, but I've seen lots of pictures. Um, so I think it's always interesting to think about um, the geography of reception and the, the political resonances in contemporary culture. And I'm sure you're absolutely right that Tacitus and tyranny go together. The, the Tacitus is the standard author for thinking about tyranny. And as I'm sure you know, there's a whole history of, of this in, in Europe, going back to the Discorsi of Machiavelli. Uh, and uh, big connections with American republicanism. There's, there's a, actually a very influential translation in the 18th century into English of Tacitus by uh, the Whig uh, Thomas Gordon, who was a pretty radical Whig, but was basically paid off by Walpole, the prime minister, so that he wouldn't cause too much trouble in, in the UK. But his translation in the 1730s was a major text which did inspire both the American Revolution to a degree, and through that, of course, the French Revolution. And this takes us back to the beginning of your talk with, with these Jacobins, uh, because they are clearly following exactly what's going on in France. Camille Desmoulins, the most famous, uh, perhaps, of uh, the revolutionary intellectuals, uh, and his uh, radical newspaper, the uh, Vieux Cordelier, the old cobbler, basically uses the annals of Tacitus pretty much straight as a criticism of tyranny, as to criticism of what he thinks is going wrong with the French Revolution in this time of the terror. So that there's a very close link, I think, with the revolution across Europe and perhaps in the previous generation um, back in America as well. Uh, the Germania, I think, has obviously had the most uh, spectacular political career in terms of, of tyranny. And my uh, friend Christopher Krebs at Stanford has written, of course, that splendid book, which tells you all about that. The Agricola in, in our country, in Britain, the Agricola has 
been often been a focus of discussion about the Roman Empire, partly because the Agricola itself presents voices of opposition against the Roman Empire. The wonderful speech of Calgacus at the Battle of, Man, Battle of Man, Mons Graupius, where he famously says the Romans make a desert and call it peace. And uh, people have detected that Testus can see the other side of empire there. And that's been uh, in Mark Bradley's book uh, recently discussed, for example. So I think there's a whole context here of uh, uh, Tacitian works uh, reflecting on themes of tyranny, reflecting on themes of empire, and uh, the writing back from the provinces, as it were, uh, is, is going on. In terms of the issues of translation, uh, I mean, it's very unfortunate that I can't say much about the, the details of, of, of the Hungarian, but uh, I think it's very clear to anyone who's had to teach Tastus, as you and I both have, uh, that it's very tough for students and scholars to read. And the brevity and density of Tastus's Latin are I think themselves a political choice. I think Ronald Syme was, was absolutely right about this, uh, that they present essentially a, a terse and amb deeply ambivalent approach to the subject matter. And this is reflected, I think, in the debates about the characterization of Tiberius in Testus's Annals. You get, as it were, on the one hand, people who think that he is he's the parody tyrant, that he's always uh, uh, completely devious and insincere. And you get people like uh, David Schotter and other modern historians who want to defend uh, Tiberius and to say that Testus is, is being unjust to him. So that debate, of course, is, is going on in, in the scholarship as well. But for me, I think the, the uh, deliberately terse and ambivalent style of Testus is political. And for me, it's about literary history. It's about being Sallust again, uh, just as Sallust expresses the downfall of the Roman Republic through his ambivalent and, and terse language. Uh, and of course, before that, Thucydides. So it's about it's a language which is about political difficulty and perhaps political uh, downfall. But uh, I suppose the question I'd like to ask is, what were Borgec's politics? I mean, was he someone who was keen to stay on board with the government? Because that's what you implied, and that's what I would expect from the evidence that you've given us, and, and from his very successful career under a relatively authoritarian uh, regime. Uh, so maybe... Uh, his political choice in presenting, as well, Tiberius as the good guy is also reflects something of his own political situation, not one which I would like to find myself in, in myself. Um, uh, and I think, especially with Tacitus, uh, translation is always political. So that's really all I want to say, but I want to thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. And uh, uh, I think there are lots of wider themes here. Well, many thanks to you, Stephen Harrison, for your fertile reply. Uh, I can already feel a lot of questions forming in my mind for the question and answer session, and I think that'll be widely uh, present from our audience. So we'll cut off for 10 minutes and reconvene for what looks like a very 